Science and technology have become prime drivers of global competitiveness, changing the fate of nations. China's economic future, as outlined in the 13 five-year plan, 2016 to 2020, is founded on innovation, especially in science and technology. But while science is greatly valued in China, it has a complex history. For a thousand years, China led the world in science. The four great inventions of modernity, compass, gunpowder, paper, printing, were all invented in China. But when China turned insular, closing itself off from the rest of the world, it fell far behind the West and into abject decline. Historically, science was never a centerpiece of Chinese culture, and China didn't begin to promote science fully until the early 20th century. To know where science is going in China, let's examine its recent history. We feature an exclusive conversation with a pioneer of China's science, the former chairman of China's State Science and Technology Commission, Dr. Song Jian. To tell the story of science in China is to bring us closer to China. Many marvel at China's ancient civilization, but in terms of modern science and technology, China is a latecomer. China's ancient science and technology peaked around the time of the earliest Song Dynasty from 960 to 1127, but declined after the Ming Dynasty began in 1368. For thousands of years, China's old-style schools taught mainly Confucianism, literature, and other liberal arts. It was not until 1895 that China's first state-run modern university was founded and natural science was introduced into the curriculum. Moreover, China's industrialization commenced in the 1860s, almost 100 years behind the West, and the process was greatly disrupted by numerous wars. I was privileged to speak with Dr. Song Jian, who was chairman of China's State Science and Technology Commission from 1984 to 1998. It was under Dr. Song's leadership that China began developing its high-tech industries. In addition, joining us are Mr. Run Yuling, a former senior official in the State Science and Technology Commission, and Dr. Lu Bai, a neuroscientist who spent over 20 years in the U.S. and is now at Tsinghua University. Dr. Sung Jian was state counselor and chairman of the State Science and Technology Commission from 1986 to 1998. During this time span of 12 years, he led the transformation of China's science system, which then propelled China's economic growth and improved the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Under Dr. Sung's leadership, the Sparks program catalyzed rural industry and the Torch program gave rise to high-tech giants including Lenovo and Huawei. Dr. Sung's advice helped create the National Natural Science Foundation. Born in a difficult age and to a poor family, Sung Jian grasped the chance to study and step-by-step step was promoted to the position that oversaw China's science and technology. He said his conviction was to rejuvenate China through science and education he has devoted his life to this grand vision. With all the great developments in China, science and technology is a critical part of what made China what it is today. And to understand science and technology, you, we have to understand its history, its relationship in China. And you've lived this history literally throughout your life. I'm looking forward to hearing it, particularly during its crucial times from the middle 1980s to the late 1990s when you were responsible for all science and technology in China as chairman of the State Science and Technology Commission. So I look forward to our discussions uh, about science and technology in China. Science and technology in China cannot be viewed out of the context of its history. The memory of the torturous century from 1840 to 1945 is still fresh for all Chinese. From the Opium War to the first half of the 20th century, the whole nation pondered, why was everything so lame? Why were we lagging behind? Why so much sacrifice? Why no access to a happy life? Finally, we reached a consensus. In particular, the thinkers and intellectuals gained an insight on how science and technology mattered. 
Our misfortune arose from the decline of science and technology, which was a result of the closed-door policy of the Qing dynasty. The May 4th movement started in 1919, when intellectuals called upon society to develop science and technology. If China wants a happy life for its people, it must have two elements in place. One, democracy. No autocracy or dictatorship can be practiced. Second, science. Only with science and democracy can our nation improve people's lives and have prosperity for the future. The May 4th movement in 1919 was an anti-imperialist, anti-feudal political and cultural campaign. In the two most important modern values, the movement promoted to reinvent China were science and democracy. At that time, the young Chinese were seeking a way to end the decades of invasion and occupation by the foreign countries. Begun around 1840 with the Opium Wars, the decline of the Qing dynasty proved that cutting itself off from the outside world would not help China. Ancient China can be counted as an Eastern Empire. Back then, China was really large, perhaps the earliest and most powerful empire in the world. What did we use to support ourselves? Science and technology. Joseph Needham authored the book Science and Civilization in China to record the history of our country's scientific development. I have read the book, and he really has a very good summary of everything. The four great inventions are known to everybody. The compass, paper making, typography, the gunpowder. But actually we invented a lot more. Seismograph, Chinese herb medicine, etc. Science and technology really promoted China's development. This has to be fully recognized. But later, corruption led to the decline of our economy. No doubt about it. But more importantly, after 1840, a lot of imperial countries became united and attacked China, thrusting China into abject poverty. The Chinese culture is uh, largely, after, in 2000 years, based on Confucius. And uh, the entire history, uh, they respect more um, poetry, um, literature, philosophy than science. Science has never been a centerpiece. Science has been perhaps some utility. It's never been considered to be a high-level intellectual uh, 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 pursuit, if you will. And, and, and the other thing is that China has, in its history, never been through something like uh, Enlightenment or Renaissance. Uh, there's no Newton, uh, there's no uh, Darwin, and there's a one period in China's recent history, which is the May Force uh, movement. Beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. In which there are two slogans. One is called a Mr. Democracy, and the other is called a Mr. Science. Yeah. But I think it's incomplete, you know, because of war, because of uh, all these other civil wars and also Japanese invasion. This has not been con uh, uh, complete. China has been pursuing the goal for a century after a hundred years of civil wars and wars against invaders. According to current estimates, 30 years make a new generation. And so a hundred years saw three generations of conflict without the development of science and technology. It was after the founding of the new China that we stopped fighting and started to shift our focus to industrialization and science. When New China was founded, it was very poor. But yet, even in the early years, there was great scientific uh, achievement uh, that China created uh, in the development of the atomic bomb, uh, initial space program. Uh, why is it that even though China was so poor in those early years, that it was able to devote resources uh, to scientific endeavors? When the new China was first established, more countries blocked China, severely restricting our development and threatening our safety. 
So it means that a very poor and vulnerable country like ours would have to have strong national security. Otherwise, we would find it difficult to stand well on our own. So no matter how difficult it is, we will strengthen ourselves in terms of the weapons we get as a nation. Only when we make great achievements, say making atomic bombs, rockets and satellites, as I myself had experienced, would the whole country applaud. Why? We have stronger national security. For about 20 years in the 1980s and the 1990s, we were dedicated to reform and opening up. Under Mr. Teng Xiaoping's policy, we achieved quite a lot over the years. We blazed our trail for modern science and technology in China and rolled out the strategy of revitalizing the country through science and education, which was highly critical for us. Mr. Deng Xiaoping put forth the idea of focusing on economic development driven by science and technology. But to set off the development of science and technology in China, there were four things to do. First, promoting education. Higher education or science-based education with more focus on science and engineering. Without the proper development of higher education, people will not be well educated. The most talented young people will not receive enlightenment from science and technology. All former Chinese leaders, Mr. Deng Xiaoping in particular, attached great importance to education. Mr. Deng even personally oversaw the work on entrance examinations to universities and colleges in China. With his efforts, the system started enrolling students and training talents from 1977. In addition, Mr. Deng insisted on sending students to the UK and the U.S. for overseas studies. The more, the better. His goal was to send over tens of thousands. One of the most important factors in China's rapid development in science is obviously talent. Since New China was founded, more than half of Chinese students studying overseas returned to the motherland. Many of them became the core of their fields. The tragedy of the Cultural Revolution, which began in 1966, interrupted almost everything, including college education. After the decade-long political havoc, China's then paramount leader Deng Xiaoping personally pushed to resume the Gaokao, or college entrance examination, in 1977. Whether a student will be enrolled in a college, and if so, which one, was now decided by his or her performance on the exam instead of by family background. This gave hope to millions of young Chinese. Over the years, China has been enhancing its system to educate students in science and technology. According to 2014 statistics of Ministry of Education, there are over 215,000 full-time staff working on research and development in China's universities. China must independently develop its education system. The number of universities has already soared from around 200 at the start to 2,500 at present. Our ultimate goal is to have at least one university per area. In the 1950s, only about 20,000 students nationwide were enrolled in universities every year. Now we have 7.5 million, with more than 600,000 masters and PhD students. So in my mind, this is great progress. Each year, hundreds of thousands go abroad. They pay their own way to the US, the UK, Australia, Canada, etc. to get an education abroad. According to some statistics I came across last year, about 3 million young people studied abroad from the 1980s to present. A million of them have returned to China for employment and became pillars of China's science and technology development. This is how the policy of opening up helps. China's scientific development lags behind that of the UK, the US and Russia by 200 years, and industrialization by 150 years. Now it is high time for a generation to catch up. Second, training and attracting talented people in large batches. 
Third, increasing investment to support science and technology. It was never easy to find investment in the 1980s. Despite the difficulties, we need to spare money for the capable and the talented to develop science, technology and industrialization. Fourth, allowing flexibility for policies and staying open to everything. In the past, individuals were never encouraged to do business, but current policies have become market-oriented. We even encourage some people in research organizations and universities to set up their own businesses. Dating back to the very early years, half of the 250 research stations were encouraged to be more market-oriented. Researchers should be invited to the marketplace for them to get a clear idea of what to do to meet the demands of the market and improve society's productivity. A good example is the establishment of national high-tech industrial zones under the TORCH program. So far, there are about 120 national high-tech industrial zones in China, and more than 20,000 companies with about 10 million staff operate in these zones. These companies enjoy total revenues of about 22 trillion renminbi or over 3.5 US dollars, and accounted for 10 percent of China's GDP in 2014. World-renowned companies like Lenovo, Huawei and ZTE thrive in these zones. Substantial progress in supercomputer, telecommunication and bioengineering has been achieved in these zones. As you know, uh, China's history, uh, recent history has uh, ups and downs. And a lot of times science is leading the way to uh, get out of the troubles and, and or do at least uh, uh, something. For example, during cultural revolutions, almost everything shut down. But you, there's still uh, sporadic uh, areas where people can still do science. Uh, for example, acupuncture. People use the name of acupuncture actually to do neuroscience, right? So that's, uh, 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 and then during the uh, uh, 1989 uh, times, well, uh, a lot of Western um, scientists are pulling out from China, Western investment pulling out of China, but science is still in an area uh, where uh, uh, government could focus on and um, kind of pull people together. Unlike in the 1970s or 1980s, science is now becoming less popular among Chinese students. According to a survey by a job hunting website, only 3% of females and 7% of males want to engage in research work. More and more young people prefer to become entrepreneurs, bankers, lawyers, or civil servants which either offer higher salaries or have more power in society. The last several generations of China's most senior leaders all were trained in science and became engineers before they went into politics. Uh, today, it's different. There are leadership have different training and uh, economics and law and different aspects. And even we see among students today, there is less interest in focusing on science and engineering and more in investment banking or entrepreneurship or ways to make money. Uh, how do you see this uh, trend where uh, a scientific and engineering background is not as important as it was uh, uh, a couple of decades ago? In 1956, China proposed that it should promote scientific development. At that time, we had three scientists surnamed Chen, Chen Xuesen, Chen Sanqiang, and Chen Weichang. With Chen Sanqiang becoming the first to receive national recognition and a reward, I remember they each got 10,000 RMB as a bonus for their work. 10,000 RMB at that time equals several millions nowadays, so we were really impressed. Therefore, when the central government called on everybody to aim for science and technology, many young people like me made up our minds to become engineers. When my professor asked me about my goal, I answered that I wanted to be an engineer. Actually, many students wanted to learn science and engineering, particularly engineering. And most of the former leaders of China were engineers. Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao are both examples. At the same time, we are also aware that nowadays many are learning finance and law, driven by the temptation of a good salary and other tendencies in society. Today many lack the patience and willingness to work down to earth, which is what we need.
Also, research takes time to deliver results. So people's desire for quick success also causes quite a great impact on society. Of course, anyone would know through his parents who do science, legal, and engineering work how much they earn, or who work at the Chinese Academy of Sciences what the salary is. Such information matters, as it exerts a subtle influence on young people, many of whom would then refuse to carry out scientific research and innovation with a down-to-earth attitude, which is against the direction we should head for and creates a bad tendency in society. In terms of students, this is pretty bad. This is pretty bad. I mean, this is true perhaps in the United States and perhaps more so in the United States. I've heard uh, Harvard's presidents uh, uh, talk to students about this and, you know, I mean, it's all driven by money and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, everyone wants to have uh, a better life and then a better life is somehow associated with, uh, to a certain extent, with money. So, I mean, there's not much you can complain about people who choose to do this. It's about what we can do in, uh, as a, you know, policymakers, as educators. Uh, I think from my perspective, I would tell my students, you know, I mean, I've seen many people who have a lot of money but still unhappy. Uh, 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 wealth is not always associated with um, happiness or even success is not always, always associated with um, uh, happiness. As you look to the future, as you see China now, how do you feel and those of your generation, revolutionaries and have experienced uh, China's remarkable uh, uh, development after so many problems of all different kinds, how, how do you feel about China today, particularly its role in the world in terms of China making a contribution to world culture and world science and technology? Basic research is the foundation of high-tech development and should enjoy national support as the major source of funding. Actually, China's Ministry of Finance has increased its earmark for research. In recent years, China's scientific community has made a lot of progress in physics, biology, astronomy, geography, etc. But I think there's still a long way to go before we can compete with America and Europe. We need to change the social structure we were used to in the farming society and emphasize education with greater openness and more investments. As a late comer in science and technology, China naturally needs generations of efforts for further progress. This gap can never be bridged overnight, and so I think we should not be too anxious. If we just continue working hard following the present direction, within one or two generations, I believe we would likely be on the way to make greater contributions to mankind. Current science and technology in China is not yet capable of playing a decisive role in the fields of basic research or high technology and still requires further learning and development. But regarding basic industry, China has learned a lot and is doing quite well in building houses, generating electricity, paving roads, growing crops, etc. Generally, we still excel in these fundamental production sectors not only due to our large population, huge size and scale of development and determination, but also because of our science and technology development. Therefore, I really appreciate and admire the innovation of AIIB, or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which quite matches China's conditions and facilitates our projects in building high-speed railways, power plants and water conservation. Having built the Three Gorges Dam, China is starting to lead in a well-rounded way in terms of water conservation, electricity transmission, civil engineering, dam building, cement and steel industry, etc. The whole world is looking to Chinese companies for relevant support. All the achievements we have made will help realize AIIB's purpose. For China to maintain its momentum, science is crucial. China's leaders emphasize science and technology to enhance the spirit of the country as well as to develop the strength of the economy. When the Chinese academies of science and engineering hold their biennial conference, all China's leaders, every member of the Politburo Standing Committee, attend for the full day 
and President Xi Jinping gives the address. In no other country do political leaders so honor its scientists. When Tu Yo Yo won China's first Nobel Prize in Science for her discovery of an anti-malaria drug, it was a source of national pride, but also of controversy because she is not a member of the elite Chinese Academy of Sciences. China would do well to heed the advice of Dr. Song Jen, a true scientist who in his mid-80s continues to be productive. In the spirit of full disclosure, Dr. Song is my mentor in China. It was he who first invited me to China in the late 1980s, and I visit him frequently. How is China seeking to catch up with the scientific capabilities of developed countries? We follow China's science to keep closer to China.